Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram and this is episode 130 on March 16th, 2016. That's when it's uh, recorded. And you can see all of my episodes at uh, my video blog, walkinthepark.tv, walkinthepark.tv. This week we're going to go over to Watkins Glen. This is an aerial view by photographer Bill Hecht looking down on the village on the right, the lake in the upper center, and to the lower left is Watkins Glen State Park in the gorge there, which has been a tourist attraction since the Civil War. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, we're going to talk about today, we're going to look at um, a, an artist that was uh, actually the resident artist in Watkins Glen in what's now the park, before the park was created, but when it was a tourist resort back in the late 1800s, beginning in 1872, actually. Uh, a guy named James Hope. So we'll trace how he got there and uh, we'll probably do this as two shows and uh, because this is a long program so we'll get the first part of him getting to the park and getting to up into Rainbow Falls and then we'll continue on next week so uh, this is a, um, uh, a visualization from the 19th century of what it must have looked like from the air I don't know how they did this but uh, looking down on the village at that time and on the right is Seneca Lake with steamboats coming into port, bringing in tourists. And the left is the, actually, you can see the gorge there. And at that time, there were hotels and things. So this is what the main entrance to the gorge looks like today. Certainly not what uh, <clears throat> would have been seen back then. We'll see some pictures of that. And they've made some improvements. Uh, so you can get up to the, uh, uh, walk up to the tunnel on the right by these steps. And there are some interpretive signs looking at the first waterfall in the gorge, entrance cascade, and then here's the entrance tunnel, and that's how people enter the gorge today. A lot of this is going to change, actually, uh, in the main entrance. They're going to do a lot of improvements. They have a few million dollars they've gotten to be able to uh, fix up the main entrance in the gorge. But uh, we're going we're gonna to see what it's like today. Now looking, you can see the entrance uh, cascade there, and then you can see a bridge above that, almost to the top of the picture there, upper right. And just below that bridge is a hole, a dark place, a hole in the rock. And that is all that remains of the 19th century, in, uh, at least in terms of human um, artifacts in the gorge. So uh, here's some, <clears throat> some folks. There's a guy there in a path in the gorge. This is back in the 19th century. And you look down in the lower center there, there's a little dam. And that dam was up behind... The cliff there, see what I was saying. Here's a closer view of that little dam. That dam's not there anymore. And what that dam did is it, it shunted water through this hole in the rock. Now, this, this uh, hole is no longer used, but that's the hole we saw up here, just under the bridge on the upper right. <clears throat> and then it was no longer used after tourists started using the place because that hole actually um, fed this thing, which is the ruin of a um, flume trough that um, uh, water came through the cliff, through that hole, dammed up by that little dam, and went down to, let's see, oh yeah, here's another picture of it, uh, the trough and also some uh, footsteps and so forth. This is early park stuff, and well, pre-park stuff. It went down to this mill that was in what's now the parking lot in the main entrance to the park. And the mill, if you look in the extreme left of the mill, you may be able to see a light-colored thing coming in, joining the mill. That is a trough that came off the flume. Now, this is looking back the other way, where the mill would have been on the right, but this is these days, of course. And then here's what it looked like, pretty much the same view, back in the 1860s. And so this is the other side of the mill. The mill wasn't operating at this point, but uh, here is an artist. Uh, uh, depiction of it, a woman artist named uh, Frances Fawcett that did a lot of art, has done a lot of artwork for exhibits in the parks. Uh, so you can see where that flume trough came down and uh, then took a, um, a turn into the mill and went over that overshot wheel inside the mill and powered this plaster mill. So uh, that's what was there before there was, um, that was in the transition time in the 1860s that uh, <coughs> the uh, Watkins Glen, which had been called Great Gully before that, and uh, Glen Creek was called Mill Creek, uh, was used for water power. And there were about three different mills on Glen Creek or Mill Creek. 
But um, Samuel Watkins owned the gorge. He was the guy that pretty much founded the village. He, um, he uh, put together about four different little hamlets and created the village of Jefferson. And he, um, but then he passed away in 1851. And a guy named George Freer came to uh, um, own the Glen. He married uh, Samuel Watkins' widow, Cynthia. And then when she passed away, not long after that, he inherited the Glen. So it became called uh, um, Freer's Glen. It originally was, I guess, Watkins Glen, but it became Freer's Glen. And um, so he uh, was approached by this gentleman, a guy named Morvalden Ells, who had been brought to town to uh, run the local weekly newspaper. And he, um, he fell in love with the place, with the, with the gorge. And he'd been around. He had seen other places in the country where there um, were scenic attractions, like in the Catskills. This is a uh, Hudson River School painting of uh, what's called North Lake in the Catskills. And in the left of center is the Catskill Mountain House. It's quite a resort back in the 1800s. So there was a, a scenic tourism, that was, a lot of which was inspired by uh, painters. So Morval than else, he came to, um, he persuaded Freer to, let's try to open this place up. So um, during the Civil War, it actually was in the middle of the Battle of Gettysburg, but nobody knew that at the time. Uh, they opened it up and uh, started building trails and so forth in the gorge. And the mill was no longer operating. And you can see the, the trough is gone, the, the flume trough is gone. And um, here's another picture. And then the people are there. You can see in the lower center there um, are tourists. They're wearing, um, you know, Victorian dress. Certainly not work clothes. Those are not millers. And the the entrance to the gorge was rebuilt. There was a nice stairway built in there. And you can see a bridge just left the center there, uh, a footbridge over the top of that entrance cascade. And here is a view from up in that area, looking back to the mill. So this was all happening in the 1860s in Freer's Glen. By the end of the decade, it was uh, renamed Watkins Glen, and the village itself had been renamed Watkins after Samuel Watkins. His widow uh, persuaded the town to name Jefferson, as it was called, to rename it Watkins. And it was Watkins Glen, no longer Freer's Glen, and uh, he no longer owned it. He sold it off, I guess. And so here's another picture looking at uh, entrance cascade area. And then you can see maybe that wooden bridge up there, just above the waterfall. It's a little dark. And then looking back from a little bit higher up, up is that wooden bridge, which is called um, Sentry Bridge, and then the, um, the wooden uh, walkways. This is before there was the entrance tunnel, which I showed you earlier, that took you up on the bridge by coming through the cliff. So uh, this is what they did. This was the early days. This is what it looks like in modern times, the stone bridge that was built, um, well actually it was, it was a concrete built bridge built in 1908 or so and then replaced in the 1930s with this uh, stone masonry faced bridge. But back there in the 1800s this is what it was like. People could go up in the Glen, they'd come stay at a hotel that was either at the Glen or in, in town and wander up there and it was a, it was a um, popular tourist destination as more Val than else, the promoter had um, dreamed, and it was uh, very successful. And this is a zoom in on the same people in that last shot. I just love the hats. I want some of those hats. So I like the I like the top hat there, and the guy in the upper right. I like his hat too. If you can see that, that might be chopped off on your screen. But uh, they had all kinds of wooden structures for getting through the glen. They didn't last too long because uh, they're made of wood, and things like ice and landslides and floods would tend to rip them out pretty easily. So the stonework that we have now is a little more durable. Here's a couple posing back then. Obviously dressed in good clothes. They were not, uh, they were not hiking, hiking clothes so much. And Morval and Ellis wrote a guidebook which had a number of editions and then there was some artwork, some uh, drawings and so forth showing you some of the staircases and so forth. This is, happens to be Rainbow Falls which is uh, our destination, our final destination in this this uh, part one of this uh, story about um, about um, James Hope, James Hope the uh, painter, which we'll get to in a moment. So, while well, talking about James Hope, James Hope was um, he was a landscape painter, but before that he was a portrait painter, and he originally came from uh, 
originally came from Scotland as a kid when he was about eight years old or so. And after his, after his mom has died, his, his um, father um, brought him to actually Montreal. And they settled there. Let's see what I've got here. Uh, yeah, no, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Anyway, um, and then after his father died, when he was about 15 years old, he walked from Montreal to Vermont and um, became studied to become a, a Wainwright, a cart maker. There's some other information here I'm trying to look up here. And then, here we go. Yeah, he's 15 years old and became a cart maker. And then he became a, um, a portrait painter. That was his real love, was painting although portrait painting itself was not what he really wanted to do. It was landscape painting. So there are some scenes in Vermont that he did, and he would sold some of his landscape stuff, but he made his living and supported his family um, with uh, his painting and teaching painting, that sort of thing. So these are scenes in Vermont. <clears throat> this is actually on the Potomac River outside of D.C. And this was all part of the time of the Hudson River School of Landscape Painting in America, which was America's first um, um, sort of homegrown style of painting, of, of um, movement of painting and landscape painting, celebrating our wild lands and a change of attitude from a utilitarian atti attitude to a, um, uh, an aesthetic appreciation and loving of nature and seeing, seeing the divine in nature and that sort of thing. So this is a famous painting by... Uh, uh, a guy named Asher Durant, who was um, a con well, almost a contemporary of Thomas Cole. But let me get to this here. Let's see. Kindred Spirits is a painting by Asher Brown Durant, a member of the Hudson River School of Painters. It depicts the painter Thomas Cole, who is the figure on the right near the edge of the cliff, who had died in 1848, and his friend, the poet William Cullen Bryant, in the Catskill Mountains. The landscape painting, which combines geographical features in Catterskill Clove and a minuscule depiction of Catterskill Falls, is not a literal depiction of American geography. Rather, it is an idealized memory of Cole's discovery of the region more than 20 years prior, his friendship with Bryant, and his ideas about American nature. So that was often the case that there were idealized landscapes that they painted, and they also put in a lot of cultural elements. So uh, Thomas Cole was uh, considered the, the originator of this style of painting, uh, he lived in New York City, and he would go up to Catskill, New York, where he had a house. And um, he, um, he was very successful. He was known for his realistic and de detailed portrayal of American landscape and wilderness, which features themes of romanticism. So there you go. So um, this is one of his paintings. This one is called Home, Home in the Woods. But he had many other kinds of paintings. And his only student and probably more famous than Cole himself was Frederick Church. Oh, uh, Frederick Edwin Ch uh, Church. Okay. Was the product of the second generation of the Hudson River School and the only pupil of Thomas Cole, the school's founder. So um, James Hope actually knew, had met um, Frederick Church and um, was influenced by both of those gentlemen and many other painters. This is um, one of Frederick Church's paintings of that same place I showed you before that had the Catskill Mountain House, North Lake, which is actually a state campground now. And you can find the ruins of the, or the, the site of the former Catskill Mountain House there. So, but um, James Hope was, um, well, it came along the Civil War in 1861, and he decided to uh, play his part and he organized a, um, a regiment from Vermont to go down and uh, fight in the war in the Union Army. And he was a, um, to be a scout, but uh, as, because he was an artist, he was used to, uh, to record a lot of sketches of battle scenes and so forth. He was in like a dozen battles. And uh, he's also, he fell into ill health, so they really used him as a map maker and uh, as an artist. And uh, which I probably was fine with him. Here's one of his famous paintings. This is the the Army of the Potomac. Let's see, painted in 1865 near the end of the war. So <clears throat> here we go. This is a, a, a detail showing a, a troop of cavalry coming up. 
So this is actually what he's best known for is his Civil War paintings. And we'll talk more about that probably next time. Next time, yeah. So, um, so James Hope was, uh, after the war, he, he went to New York City. He had, he had uh, begun uh, uh, in the wintertime going into the um, cities to paint portraits to support his family. He couldn't do it in rural Vermont. He did it in Montreal. He went to New York City. So in the 1860s, after the war, he was in New York City in the winter painting in his little studio, and people would pay him for portraits. But he didn't really, that wasn't his great love. His great love was, was landscape painting, and he did get some, uh, uh, some recognition for that. Was, um, let's see, there was something from there. Oh, yeah, he, um, he displayed some of his, his landscape paintings in, in the National Academy of Design, and uh, he got some good, good, good reviews, and it was noticed. So, so this uh, led to the next chapter in his life. There was a gentleman who had uh, his name. Let's see if I get his name here. Yeah, P. J. Rolfe, and his um, his associates um, had been to Watkins Glen. Now, um, so this would have been in uh, yeah the late he probably 1870 or so he'd been there. And he fell in love with the place, and he had been up to Rainbow Falls, and this is what it looks today. And he was um, totally enamored, so he wanted to get a um, a painting of it. So here's a let's just take a look at a couple of pictures of Rainbow Falls. So there, this is a sun hitting in late afternoon sun hitting the waterfall in the center of the picture there, and then you you really can only see it from the other side. And there's a little rainbow there, and it's very sweet. It's not like a big rainbow you see at Niagara Falls or something like that. But it was enough of, a, enough of an attraction to influence this guy. In 1871, he published a book called Roughing It. And, of course, this was Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain, who lived in now, nearby in Elmira in the late 1860s, and he tried to convey the remarkable beauty of Rainbow Falls in roughing it. So I'm going to quote from him. If one desires to be so stirred by a poem of nature wrought in the happily commingled graces of picturesque rocks, glimpsed distances, foliage, color, shifting lights and shadows, and falling water, that the tears almost come into his eyes so potent is the charm exerted, he need not go away from America to enjoy such an experience. The Rainbow Fall in Watkins Glen, New York, on the Erie Railway, is an example. It would recede into pitiable insignificance if the callous tourist drew an arithmetic on it. But left to compete for the honors simply on scenic grace and beauty, the grand, the august, and the sublime being barred the contest, it could challenge the old world and the new to produce its peer. So uh, Rainbow Falls... Um, was um, certainly recognized as a gorgeous place. So, so um, James Hope was uh, commissioned. He accepted the commission to um, to paint Rainbow Falls for for the Mr. Rolf, and uh, he um, he then went in the spring of 1871. He went to Watkins Glen. He went to the gorge, the village of Watkins, and the gorge of Watkins Glen. It was called by this time, and. This man, Morvell than Els, took him up through the glen on the old uh, uh, staircases and so forth. So, so uh, here he was. He was going there. Now, 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 James Hope was offered, he was promised, $10,000 to paint Rainbow Falls. Now, that was a huge amount of money back then, as you can imagine. So uh, he, um, it was going to be a big painting. And so it was um, pretty cool. So, so he definitely accepted that. It meant that he couldn't go home to his family in Vermont, as he did every summer, but uh, eventually they did follow him over to Watkins Glen. And so Morval and Ells took him up in the glen, and by this time, the mill was gone. This is the main entrance area again. They called the entrance amphitheater. They had a, um, a ticket booth, and you may be able to make out the fencing there that keeps the, uh, the um, people from sneaking by the ticket booth. And so they went on up in the glen, and again, they had these... Uh, wooden staircases and structures that were pretty cool. And here again is the picture of the original Century Bridge. They went over Entrance Cascade and then up into the gorge above that. This is the uh, called Minnehaha Falls. 
And then there's another um, photo dra gravure, it's called, of it. And this is a modern picture showing Minnehaha Falls in the lower center. And in the background, in the middle of what's called Cavern Gorge, is, um, is Cavern Cascade. Now these days, you go behind Cavern Cascade via a tunnel that goes up through the cliff. But back then, you had to take what was called the Long Stairs. These days, you go right behind it and up through a spiral tunnel and come out on top of the cliff and look down on it. But you had to take the long stairs to get up over that cliff. And um, so uh, that's the first big section they went to. He, I'm sure he was just totally amazed. And uh, let's see where else he went. Back of, beyond um, the um, Cavern Cascade was a section that for a while was called Glen Obscura because it was hard to see and was uh, not very good route through it, I guess, for a while there. There, there were other things going on, which I'll tell you more about next time. But uh, here are people up in Glen Obscura. Yeah. So it's neat. We're taking a uh, 19th century tour up through the gorge at Watkins Glen. Finally coming up close to, to what's called the Glen Cathedral. And here it is. It's a big, wide open area. It inspired everybody. To, it felt like being in a... Uh, a grand cathedral somewhere with the arching walls. Here's some folks in it. The Glen Cathedral. So Morval de Nels named most of these places in the Glen. Um, perhaps even James Hope, since they became good friends, perhaps he uh, participated in that as well. So um, so these are these historic, a lot of these historic pictures, particularly like this one, are, are one half of a, of a stereo viewer, which um, Back in those days, they had a special camera with two lenses on it, two cameras, basically, two plates that were a few inches apart. And you took the picture at the same time uh, such that they would be offset uh, to a degree that was similar to what how offset your eyes are. And then you'd stick this card with the two pictures on them in a viewer, and it would create a 3D image. Pretty cool thing. It'd be nice if that came back. So here is a modern-day picture looking back on the Glen Cathedral. So it definitely is a an impressive spot. There's a woman here sitting down uh, in the Glen Cathedral somewhere. But to get out of the Glen Cathedral, you have to go up this staircase called the Grand Staircase. Now just to the left, lower left there in this um, picture from a um, stereograph is Central Cascade, which is actually the tallest waterfall in the gorge. It's about, only about 50 feet tall, but that's tall for Watkins Glen. Here's a little another picture of the, <coughs> the Grand Staircase and the Central Cascade. These days, you take a stone staircase up around, um, the bypass, and get to the top of um, Central Cascade, and you may be able to make out just above the waterfall. There's a bridge up there. You have to go through a little tunnel too, which is cute. Won't show you this time. So, um, so you've gotten up through the Glen Cathedral gotten up through the uh, the area before that with the cavern cascade and so forth so um, James Hope is totally blown away he is like wow now I can see why this is a special place and he fell in love with it right away when you get up above Central Cascade and there's this bridge I don't know if you can see that on the bottom of the picture there called Folly Bridge which has been replaced by um, that stone bridge <coughs> excuse me um, that Folly Bridge is at the downstream end of the Glen of Pools. They call it Folly Bridge because um, the place they had to put it, just at the upper end of Glen Cathedral, um, is a narrow spot that tends to flood and uh, the water, that, uh, high water that comes down the gorge gets constricted there and comes bursting in over Central Cascade and tends to rip out the bridge. So uh, this bridge, Stone Bridge, has had its parapets, its walls, uh, swept off many times over the years. So, but originally called Folly Bridge, and this is the Glen of Pools, which is a series of cascading little pothole pools, plunge pools, up in the Glen there. And up above the Glen of Pools is the star of the show so far. Well, here's the drawing of uh, from the guidebook of Rainbow Falls and Triple Cascade, which is to its right, and you know that the three waterfalls there. And you can look at all the staircases in the back, and eventually a bridge was built there. But um, 
So, so James Hope, this was he. This was the waterfall he was to paint, and uh, so he he checked it out, and then he took a couple of weeks to uh, get organized while he was there, and he began painting, and he painted. Well, I don't know that it was this one, but it was one very much like this. And let me see, I've got the dement. See if I can find my notes on this particular painting. But uh, this is of Rainbow Falls, and this one was painted. Well, let's see. This one was painted in 1871, which is when he painted the big one for uh, Mr. Rolf, and it was 70, 78 inches high by 60 inches wide. So 60 inches is five feet wide, 78 is, is six and a half feet by five feet. So that's a pretty big painting. So uh, that's what he did. So here's some other smaller paintings around that, uh, let me see, where that painting is actually, uh, it's in a private collection. Um, this one is, I think, at the Schuyler County Historical Museum, and it's a little one. And here's another one in um, uh, the Watkins Glen Public Library, just small paintings. But he painted many, many of these. Well, that's all the time that we have today. We'll finish this story next time when we talk about James Hope's gallery. So uh, join us again next week.